نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدًا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون My dear brothers and sisters in Islam we begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we thank him we praise him we seek refuge in him subhanahu wa ta'ala from the evil of ourselves and the evil consequences of our own misdeeds and we remind ourselves that no one may be guided except through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and none may be misguided except whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen to be misguided and we bear witness and testify that there is none worthy of our worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his slave and his messenger. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us in the Qur'an, O you who believe, have the taqwa, the consciousness, the awareness, the fear, the reverence for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is due to him, and to not die except as Muslims. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with that. When Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an was the Khalifa, he was walking in the marketplace of Medina one time. And he passed by a man who was making dua out loud. And he was saying, Allahumma ja'alna min, al, min ibadika al-qaleel. Oh Allah, make us of your, the few servants. And he kept repeating this. So Umar radiallahu an said, where did you get this dua from? And the man said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in his book, وَقَلِيلُ مِنْ عِبَادِيَ الشُّكُورِ So Umar left the man and he wept and admonished himself and told himself, the people are more knowledgeable than you, ya Umar. And he said, Allahumma ja'alna min ibadika al-qaleel. Oh Allah, make us of your few servants. On the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will call Adam alayhi salam to bring his children, his progeny, all of mankind. And Allah will tell him to bring those who are destined for Jahannam. So Adam asks Allah, how many should I bring? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds and says, bring 99 out of every 100 for Jahannam. So Adam, he does so. When the companions heard this, they asked the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, if 99 are taken to Jahannam from every hundred, what will be left for us, Ya Rasulullah? The Prophet Ali Salaam responded, My Ummah, compared to the other nations, is like a white hair on a black bull. My dear brothers and sisters, we are that white hair on the black bull. We are supposed to be different. We are supposed to be from the qaleel, from the few. We are meant to be rare. And even among the few, there are levels and levels with even fewer. The Prophet ﷺ said in another hadith, بَدَأَ الْإِسْلَامُ غَرِيبًا وَسَيُعُودُ غَرِيبًا Islam began as something strange and will go back to being strange. So glad tidings to the strangers. My dear brothers and sisters, it has always been easy to follow the crowd and the trend throughout history. But it's no secret now, more than ever, we have to analyze and critique which crowds were following, which groups we're ending up with. When we see what's going on in Gaza, and we reject the narrative of Western media and Israel regarding what's going on, we're not following the safe trend. 
When we see people accepting Islam because of the strength of Iman of these people, who are literally facing every horror imaginable, they're accepting Islam because people naturally look up to those who are outliers, those who are successful in ways other people are not. We should look at them as well and ask what are they doing different and we should be jealous of them. They have Allah and they are the outliers. We are meant to be different. We are meant to stand out like a white hair on a black bull. Today in this short khutbah inshallah, I will discuss two points regarding us being outliers, strangers and different. Give hope to those who feel different and encourage us all to embrace it. I will then offer some action points for us to take with us so we can all inshallah rise to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves for us and what the Prophet ﷺ hoped for us. The first point, Islam is the only way to achieve success in this life and the next. I know, it's a cliche topic, I know. I understand. But hear me out, inshallah. By virtue of being a Muslim, a regular, basic, average Muslim, your everyday Ahmad, we're already included in the one out of every 99. Alhamdulillah. By being that basic, average Muslim, we're already part of the few. Alhamdulillah. But we may not find complete success in this life simply by that virtue. A Bedouin came to the Prophet ﷺ and asked him, tell me something I can do, an action, that if I do, I will enter Jannah. And the Prophet ﷺ, we all know this hadith, is mentioned in the 40 hadith of Imam al nawawi one of the, the versions of it. The Prophet ﷺ said, Worship Allah, do not commit shirk. Establish your salah, give your zakat and fast in Ramadan. These few things. The Bedouin, he responded, he said, Wallahi, I will not increase anything upon what you have said. To the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Wallahi, I will not add anything. When the man left, the Prophet ﷺ said, if anyone would like to see a man of Jannah, look to that man. My dear brothers and sisters, if you're struggling with your deen, if you're struggling with your iman, if you're struggling with your connection to Allah, perfect these things. Some people get depressed when they compare themselves to others. They look at the righteous. They read about the companions. They hear about the sahaba. And they feel so much shame that they are not like them. And sometimes it discourages them from even doing the basic things. They feel like they're not good enough. So what's the point? My dear brothers and sisters, with this hadith basically of what the Prophet ﷺ told the Bedouin to do, that's it, bare minimum. Perfect the five prayers. Perfect those, three, those few things. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will gift you more, more opportunities for khair. Second point regarding this. There's a famous author named Malcolm Gladwell. He wrote a, a, fam a book, fa it's called Outliers. It's very famous. And it's all about the factors that contribute to success. The first chapter, the very first chapter, he discuss discusses something called the Matthew effect, based on a verse in the Bible. And essentially, the idea is success is based on the opportunities and advantages you have in life. Not so much hard work and grit. And any opportunity or advantage you have already in life will increase more. It's an effect, it's a rule. And he says any disadvantage or anything, shortcoming, will continually dis decrease. And so he mentions 
all of this saying this is one of the tools for success. You have to look at your advantages and disadvantages. And this echoes what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran. وَيَزِيدُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ اهْتَدَوْ هُدَى Those with guidance, Allah will increase them in guidance. Those upon the truth will be increased in truth and given further. Another non-Muslim author, Greg McCon. I don't want you guys to think of somebody sitting in a room reading books all the time. I'm not like that. Alhamdulillah. Greg McCon, he has this book called Essentialism. And the whole point of the book is he's trying to tell people, focus on what are the great things you're going to do. Don't waste your time on the small stuff. And so one of the tools he gives in his book, and I, I'm telling you how I read it exactly. He says, for you to have this kind of vision in your life day to day, you have to wake up before everybody else. Not just that. He says you have to wake up before everybody else. And then he says you have to start your day reading a timeless book of wisdom. Something timeless. Wisdom that has lasts last for generations. So he says read the Bible. Read the, ta the Torah. He mentions another book and then he says read the Quran. Non-Muslim in his book on self-development for success in the dunya says wake up early and read the Quran. My dear brothers and sisters, this advice I don't have to tell you. The sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants for us. And yet a non-Muslim with his years of experience tells you to achieve success in this life, go and read the Quran before Fajr. My dear brothers and sisters, by virtue of committing to waking up for Fajr, for example, just by virtue of being a Muslim, sets you up for success. Waking up for Fajr, to establish Fajr, to commit to Fajr, means you're committed to sleeping early. It means you're committed to avoiding wasted time and frivolity. It means committing to interrupt your desires. It means you're on the path to self-discipline. The person who establishes Fajr can establish anything. There's another book about discipline. I know we're getting that, the hints of all these books. I forgot the name of the book. I don't know the author. His number one premise in his book, and the book is about developing discipline, how to develop discipline. The first premise of the book is, first thing he says, when you wake up, make your bed. Not make your bed after coffee and breakfast, but as soon as you get out of the bed, make your bed. So he says this because when you're doing this, when you're getting out of bed to make out of bed and you make your bed, you're interrupting your desires. First thing you want to do is go eat. First thing you want to do is go somewhere else and do something else. I'm going to sit down and have coffee. I'm going to put my clothes up, whatever it is. But if you make your bed first, you interrupt the desires. It puts you in the mindset that you're going to do the right thing regardless of what it does for you or what it means or the impact, right? This is advice from non-Muslims. Benjamin Franklin, we know, the, one of the founding fathers, he said, Early to bed, early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. Is this not the sunnah? Is this not the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ? Yet non-Muslims are coming and writing self-help books and teaching people the sunnah. Yet we are here and we're looking elsewhere. Where can I go? What can I do? Where is my assistance? Where is, what should I do? Our brothers in Islam, those of you who are here, especially our young brothers, there is something we can learn from our sisters. By virtue of being Muslim, our sisters,
The fact that they wear hijab every day, even though it's hard, and people stare, and you're not like other girls, it sets you up for so much more than what a lot of our men, uh, us as men were missing out on. Because when you wear hijab here, where it's strange, and you continue to do so despite everything calling you to take it off, it sets you up to be courageous. It sets you up to be okay to be different. By virtue of doing that one act of worship, you become one of the few. You're an outlier. You are set for success. And may Allah make you all steadfast. So what's the point of number one? By virtue of being Muslim, you're already ahead of the game. You're already an outlier. You're already gharib. فَطُوبَى لِلْغُرَبَاء Focus on and perfect these principles. Mention to the Bedouin, and Allah will give you more opportunities. Commit to yourself, commit to the bare minimum. Many of us were born into Muslim families. I know I don't look like it, but I was. And Allah chose us to grow up in this blessing. We don't have to find it. All we have to do is look over and away from everything else calling us away. Allah maj'alna min ibadik al qalil. Aqul qawli hadha wa astaghfir Allah li wa lakum wa li sa'il muslimin fa astaghfiruhu innahu huwa al ghafur rahim. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam siman kithira Ya ayuhu al-lazina amanu taqallahu haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, not every believer is the same. This is the second point. We should strive to be outliers among the believers. Why did the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam give so many special rewards, offer so many special rewards for specific actions, such as the mu'adhan having a long neck yawm al-qiyamah. Why? Is it for us to just memorize it and go on with our lives? Or is it for us to strive to become one of those outliers? I often have people come to me and they complain that they don't have a connection with Allah. They feel tired from the salawat. They feel tired from this. They don't have the, the want or the drive to read Quran or memorize or whatever. And so we tell them, not every act of worship will affect every believer the same. Some people need, everybody needs something different to have that connection and closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We all have to try different things to find what we need. There was a scholar I was with here in the United States and we were talking about this topic and he said, I don't like going to janazahs. I don't like to go to the janazahs. I don't like to follow the funeral. I don't like to wash the bodies. He said, it just it hurts my iman. Others, they love it. They thrive. When they see the dead body, when they see our brothers and sisters, when they carry the body, when they put the body in the ground, it gives them strength and it gives them iman. Some people find solace in the salah. Some people love recitation and reflection over the Quran. Some people find that connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through service to others. Some find it in fasting. Some find it in bringing people together, in feeding. We all have our acts of worship. We must find that will be great for us and will be great at. We have to be strangers among the strangers. We all know the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in which he mentions the seven shaded on the Day of Judgment. Those who will be shaded on a day there is no shade besides the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The seven, we all, know, we all know them. Of course there's more than seven, but in this one particular hadith, seven. 
It says, a just ruler, a youth who grows up in the worship of Allah, a man whose heart is hanging in the masajid, two men who love each other for the sake of Allah and they meet each other on that and they depart on that. The fifth, someone who resists, a man who resists the direct temptation or direct, direct invitation to zina from a beautiful, powerful woman. A person who gives charity such that his left hand does not know what his right hand has given. And a person who remembers Allah in private and he sheds tears because of it. These seven, what they all have in common is they're all extremely rare. They break the mold. They're outliers. There's few and far in between. They're so strange. But that's why they have such a specific, special blessing. Yom al Qiyamah. It's something for us to strive for. A just ruler. Is it normal for a ruler to be just? If we survey history, is it normal to find a ruler that has not fallen into oppression? It's easy for a ruler to fall into thinking that no one is above me. I have no one to answer to. Everyone answers to me. So they fall into the oppression easily. Very few rulers are remembered as just. Everyone in a position of responsibility or authority over others is a ruler in some way. Everyone, fathers, mothers, teachers, managers, supervisors, at work, at home, at school, in the masjid, the board, so on and so forth. It's an opportunity, not a curse. Too many people waste their time thinking and hoping to have something else. Oh, why did I have this? Why do I have that? Why am I in this position? I wish I was somewhere else. It's not a curse. It's an opportunity. Perhaps there's some of us who can look at this opportunity and this becomes our act of worship. This becomes how we become close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second, a youth who grows up in the worship of Allah. I don't need to say it. It's not normal for a youth to grow up in the worship of Allah. A young person. It's not normal to find a child or a seven or eight year old in Ramadan crying because of the recitation of Quran. It's not normal. What is normal is to find a young person, a child, a youth, an adolescent who spends their time in fun, in frivolity, in excess, in chasing things that are not going to have value. It's normal. It's in the normal range. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made us to be rebellious in that age. What is not normal again is a youth who grows up in the worship of Allah. This is on the list because it's so strange. If it was easy, why is it seven categories on the day of judgment getting something specific shade on the day there's no other shade besides the shade of Allah? Because it's special, because it's rare. Because it's few and far in between. If you are a young person, if you are a teenager, if you are under the age of 40, if you are a child, how much longer will that last? Advice to myself first. How much longer? How much longer before everything else pulls us away from all that time? What did the Prophet ﷺ say when he said, اغتنم خمس قبل الخمس? Take care of five before five. Did he not say youth before old age? Ask your elders, my dear brothers and sisters, what do they have from their youth and their childhood that remains to this day? What do they remember? What actual memories do, you, do they have of being a teenager day to day? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless our youth and our children and to guide them and guide us all. A man whose heart is attached to the masajid. What is a, heart, a man's heart usually attached to? Their work, their careers, their possessions, their bank accounts. I'm guilty of this. 
their car. What's strange is a man whose heart is attached to the masjid. And the wording of the hadith is hanging in the masjid. He hangs it up when he leaves and when he comes back, he picks it up and it's there. He doesn't feel complete until he's in the masjid. Perhaps this act of worship is for you. Perhaps this is the way you get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Getting rid of the distractions and spending time in the masajid. Fourth, two men who love each other for Allah's sake, meeting for that and parting upon that. Usually we meet people because we have a need. How often are we invited to a gathering or something and we, ah, oh, we sigh, I don't want to go and talk to people or meet people. Oh, I'm tired, I don't want, my social battery is dead. But when you meet and leave for the sake of Allah, it's because you recognize that person has rights over you. And that you benefit in your deen and your iman because of being with this person. Perhaps you're an extrovert. I need to look at it and say, I have a skill with people. And I can use this as an act of worship to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with it. And perhaps you're an introvert and you can decide who is worth your time and who is better to stay away from. It's strange to consider your intentions when meeting people. Perhaps the most important for us to discuss today, someone who resists direct temptation from the opposite gender. There's a reason the hadith specifically mentions a man who resists that temptation. And we know the reason. What would, a, what would cause a man to resist this open invitation? None. It's not normal. Non-Muslims laugh at us when we don't chase women. They mock us. That is the state of men. That you chase women and you continue doing so. And there's no end. For your whole life to be enveloped by the desire for sex and chasing women. It's not normal to reject zina entirely. How about if you're invited? Who does that? Yusuf alayhi Yusuf alayhi did it. One of the only things we remember that is mentioned about the great deeds of Yusuf alayhi salam is the fact that he did this. This act of worship, of resisting this, is so noble, it is prophet-like. It is up there. Now, alhamdulillah, we don't have the handsomeness of Yusuf to deal with this problem. Had we had it, maybe the situation would be worse. Regardless, in college campuses today, this is happening. It's an open buffet for everybody. But what's more important is recognizing the triggers for this, my dear brothers. Resisting the open invitation for, to fawahish, to fitan, for evil on our phones in private on our laptops and between women and between people and meeting and chatting. Once that's okay, it opens the door for everything else. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all steadfast. This is how we become outliers. This is how we enact change. This is how we become the few of the few. Sixth, very quickly, a person who is completely selfless in charity, they give with their right hand, not knowing what their left hand is giving. A lot of people might think about this and misunderstand it. The point is you're giving money, you're giving charity, you're giving wealth, food, whatever it is, freely without consideration with what you left behind. There's no checking the account. There's no Hisab, there's no calculating. It's I got a wad of cash, here it is. This guy's freezing on the street corner, here's my jacket. This guy's walking without shoes, there's my shoes. No consideration for how it affects you. How rare is that? 
Maybe this is the way every single one of us can become one of the few of the few. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst them. And lastly, a person who remembers Allah in private and sheds tears doing so. When was the last time you cried in general? And when was the last time you cried because you remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What was the situation? Was it you were in need? You had no way out. Was it your sins were piling up and you sought refuge with Allah? Were you sitting in a gathering in the masjid and somebody was giving a khutbah or a lecture and it made you tear up? Because that's not in private, it doesn't count. We have to look at how do we get those conditions back again. It takes getting rid of the phone. It takes going somewhere and sitting privately with nothing but yourself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No distractions. I told this to one of, the, one of our youth a while ago. I said, you need to go and do this. I said, no phone. They said, can I bring a book? No. Can I bring paper and pen? No. Go and sit with yourself and ponder over Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You want to bring Qur'an, take Qur'an. Ponder over your sins. Ponder over your arrogance. Ponder over... And this is for myself first and everyone second. We need to take a deep breath, take a step back, and reconnect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala privately. And perhaps this is the act of worship you will do great. So my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, we have discussed how committing to being Muslim sets us up for success in the dunya and the akhirah. We have discussed ways to find fulfillment and connection Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the gift of Islam. Let us embrace it. Let us find our niche in the dunya through Islam. Let us find our special place in the akhirah through the sunnah of the Prophet Let us be one of the few. Let us be that white hair on the black bull as the Prophet mentioned. Let us be one of those shaded by Allah on the day of judgment. Let us be ghuraba. Fatuba lil ghuraba. Allahumma ja'alna min ibadik al qalil. اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد وجيد اللهم صلي وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم اغفر للمسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات اللهم انصر الإسلام والمسلمين وأذل الشرك والمشركين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم اغفر المسلمين جميعا اللهم اعز الإسلام والمسلمين في غزة اللهم انصرهم وثبت أقدامهم يا رب العالمين وأقيم الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله so I did it with Tarasu. Heal on the line. Fill in the gaps. Sallu salat mudda' Pray as if this is your farewell prayer. Allah Akbar. الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آه 
سبح اسم ربك الأعلى الذي خلق فسوى والذي قدر فهدى والذي أخرج المرعى فجعله غثاء أحوى سنقرئك فلا تنسى إلا ما شاء الله إنه يعلم السر إنه يعلم ال إنه يعلم إنه يعلم الجهر وما يخفى ونيسرك لليسرى فذكر إن نفعت الذكرى سيذكر من يخشى ويتجنبها الأشقى الذي يصل النار الكبرى ثم لا يموت فيها ولا يحيا قد أفلح من تزكى وذكر اسم ربه فصلى بل تؤثرون الحياة الدنيا والآخرة خير وأبقى إن هذا لفي الصحف الأولى صحف إبراهيم وموسى الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين ضالين والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وت... إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر الله سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله